Thank you again for coming to New Orleans. It's one of the things that's most important to us in terms of getting our story told and also because tourism is such an important part of our economy. I forget what I thought initially when I was asked to be a part of this, but I certainly didn't expect to see a thousand people out in the audience. <laughs> but then again, a food conference in New Orleans tends to attract people who may have broader motives than the organizers may intend. <laughs> like Natalie and Brenda before me, I'm forced to begin my remarks with the federal levy failures five years ago. And I do that not to reiterate the massiveness of the federal abdication of responsibility. Rather, I do it because our lives came into a kind of focus then in ways that were not all bad. And I would suggest to you the lessons we learned in the context of that catastrophe that might well serve you in the context of your work in your various communities. One week after the levees failed, a gathering of us who had been exiled to Baton Rouge had a dinner of red beans and rice. It was an incredible meal because by that point, the parameters of the disaster had become far clearer. And the fact, it had become clear that we'd not be able to return home anytime soon, or certainly not in the fashion to which, in which we'd lived prior to that. But there was something affirming about that meal. Traditionally, in New Orleans, we have red beans and rice on Monday, and the story goes that that was wash day, and you needed something that you could put on the stove and let boil for hours with relatively little attention while you did the wash. But it's become a part of the culture, even in an era of washing machines and laundromats when that day no longer has that same kind of significance. And so for us, the idea of having red beans and rice on this particular Monday was an affirmation of the fact that all had not been lost, and indeed, much, if not most, of our culture would be maintained even in the face of this disaster. A few weeks after that, as our people had been scattered to the four corners of the nation, they'd ask folks, well, how does it feel for you to be in Idaho or Iowa or Alaska? And um, after a few cursory remarks about, well, it feels good to be off of my roof, it feels good to you know, not be wet, Folks invariably say, yeah, but the food don't be the same here. <laughs> and I was reminded of something I heard in a news broadcast probably two decades ago at a point of crisis in Somalia when the refugees from war were in these camps. And I asked them how it is, and they said, well, you know, it's all right, but they got all this rice in the camp, and we eat pasta. Because these are folks who had at a point been colonized by the Italians. What's striking to me is that while the food community might commend itself for having brought food to starving people, it should also accept a degree of criticism for a failure to understand the kinds of cultural sensitivities that would be important in this kind of context. In a more current circumstance, a friend of mine is working at a restaurant here that seeks to teach young people how to, to earn a living in the food service industry. There's almost nothing on the menu that reflects this place, this place that is so world famous for its food. So I said to him, how are you supposed to bring these inner city kids here and teach them the intricacies of restaurant service and tell them that everything about their food culture is not good enough for this place? So in the context of this attempt to teach them the skills they need in the workplace, you're also telling them, man, you bring nothing to this that is of any relevance at all. In addition to the insulting nature of that comment or the implications of that failure, you also get the fact that it's fundamentally false in the context of a place like this. So I would suggest to you that in the context of this discussion of food security, you broaden your concept of what that means. We all know that we hear about national security over and over and over and over again. And it's striking, of course, that national security, even in a nation that has the kind of food security problems we have, national security only refers to militaristic security. And so in that sense, we, look, we fail to look at the broader issues of security 
that folks need to be addressing. I would suggest to you that there's a kind of security you get in eating your traditional food that you don't get merely from having your stomach full. Um, Louisiana is unique in that we have a food culture that was celebrated long before the discovery of American regional cuisine. Often when I speak to students at this program Tulane University has where they bring in folks in the first semester they have to learn something about the city. So I ask them about the food tradition in their communities. They're unable to tell me what they are. I think that has less to do with the fact that these, or the idea that these traditions don't exist, than it does to do with the fact that they're certainly not celebrated and probably is so far buried in the code for memory that it would take a, a feat of excavation to find them. I would suggest to you that those traditions exist in whatever communities you're working in, and that food security has to include a kind of cultural sensitivity without which it is impossible for you to adequately do your job. Thank you.